Hello. So uh, this presentation, as you can see, is on Thomas Kuhn's ideas that he laid out in his very influential book, uh, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. So Thomas Kuhn is a name that maybe people haven't heard much about, but almost everybody's actually heard of Thomas Kuhn's ideas, as we'll see. You'll maybe notice some familiar things coming up, especially near the end of all of this. Okay, so uh, previous philosophers of science tended to focus on individual experiments and how those individual experiments are conducted and uh, how the evidence that results from those experiments logically relate to the hypotheses that are being tested. And Kuhn instead took sort of a more, almost more holistic, a more global view of science, um, trying to figure out what science is overall, rather than just zeroing in on individual experimental techniques or the specific scientific methods that people were using or the logical reasoning that people were using. So uh, he recognized after you know, observing science in action for many, many years, uh, that as we say here, all the questions that science scientists ask, uh, the kinds of tests that they do, the evidence that they gather, and everything else that they think about in their professional lives as scientists, is uh, it occurs within a specific paradigm and it's shaped by that paradigm that they believe in. So, um, it's very difficult to give just sort of a straightforward definition of a paradigm. In fact, in Kuhn's book, it sort of has a, a variety of different ways of describing what a paradigm is. Uh, but for this, I'll just kind of settle on uh, this short list of elements that go into a paradigm. So it's certainly the theory that the scientists accept. You know, what's the going theory that's accepted in a particular field of science like physics or astronomy or biology or chemistry? Uh, any equations or laws that they use to understand that theory and explain what's going on in that theory and predict what's going to happen based on that theory. Uh, the ontology that's included in their field of study. Ontology is a little bit of a fancy philosopher's term for what exists. So just as a simple example, let's say we're talking about geneticists. Well, geneticists believe that DNA exists and that DNA is roughly speaking separated into segments that represent genes and genetic information. Uh, they have to believe that those things are real because that's what they're studying. Uh, physicists, especially like high energy physicists and quantum mechanics, they certainly believe that atoms are real and that subatomic particles are real and that photons and electrons and all of those sorts of things are real. That's part of their ontology, the set of things that they consider to be a real part of the natural world and that they are in fact studying. So then also uh, everything else that they're doing in their professional life, so their methods of experimentation, how they conduct their measurements, what count as good measurements, what are the good measuring devices in that field of study, uh, what standards of evidence do they have to meet when they're reporting their results to the scientific community? Also, how they educate new people in that field of study. So new students, um, what are, what's included in the introductory textbooks and then sort of the mid-range textbooks and all the way to advanced study. How do we uh, train newcomers in this field? How do we get them incorporated into this paradigm? Okay, so. Uh, within that paradigm, then, as I said, scientists are sort of doing their regular professional life. They're uh, developing research programs, purchasing equipment, doing their studies, conducting their research, putting together their research reports, and presenting their results to the scientific community overall. So uh, the things that they're doing within that paradigm is what Thomas Kuhn called reasonably enough, normal science, because it's just the normal activity that scientists are doing throughout almost all of their career. So uh, every paradigm is going to have, uh, well, let me put it this way, every paradigm is going to be incomplete. That is, there's parts of the paradigm that haven't really been fully explored yet. There's maybe some unresolved issues or questions within that paradigm, or as Thomas Kuhn liked to call them, uh, unsolved puzzles unanswered questions 
And the paradigm gives you sort of the rough outlines about how to approach these unanswered questions or these puzzles or these unsolved problems or these details that need to get filled in within the paradigm. The paradigm gives you the rough outlines of how to do that and what sorts of answers to expect. But of course, it doesn't give you the answer that you have to do. You have to do the normal science work and do the research to figure those things out. Um, so of course, it could be refining measurements of constants, like for example, uh, within the physics paradigm, it was known that a light travels at a constant speed in a vacuum. So what is that speed? <laughs> uh, that's normal science work. Uh, it's also known that the electron has a specific negative charge on it. So how strong is that charge? Well, do the research, figure it out. This is all, as I say, normal science. Uh, here's a good example that uh, I think kind of illustrates what Kuhn was talking about. We've all heard of the periodic table before. Uh, and so this is a central component of the chemistry paradigm. This is sort of frames chemists' understanding of what it is that they're studying. This is their ontology. Right? Um, it also in informs a lot of what's going on in physics. So these, uh, this particular periodic table is color-coded according to a, the approximate time range when those elements were discovered. Because when the periodic table was first presented and first accepted into the chemistry paradigm, it was incomplete. They kind of knew, right, that there's these columns and rows that make sense for organizing the elements relative to each other. But when it was first proposed, we had sort of the ones that were known in ancient times, the uh, beige ones here, uh, and the light blue ones were also known. But all these other ones, the purple ones, the orange ones, and the pink ones, those weren't discovered until much later. Those parts of the table were empty. They had the table, but there were spaces, empty spaces in the table. So once this was part of the paradigm, then it was really clear what a lot of the normal science work was for chemists fill in the table, right? Fill in the spaces. It's almost like a, a crossword puzzle where you've got sort of the framework, right? The, and the clues and so on as to how to fill it in, but you have to do the work to fill in the blanks. And you know when you've got it right, you know, when you're on the right track, it's sort of fitting into the puzzle as defined by the paradigm. And you know when you're going wrong, uh, when something just doesn't fit and there's sort of a, a maybe kind of a incompatible components within this system that you're trying to fit together and you have to do more normal science work to resolve those misfits, um, to get it to all set together within the paradigm. Okay, well, here's a few other examples. You can pause and read those if you want, um, but just the, all of these examples of normal science can only work, you can only make progress on these things if you have a paradigm that's sort of guiding your search, it's guiding your research. You can't just start from zero um, with absolutely nothing and start doing productive research on any of these things. Okay, so uh, a few other notes about the paradigm as Thomas Kuhn described it. Um, you know, any particular scientist or any particular research group of scientists uh, tend to focus on one small area of the paradigm, filling in one area of details, resolving one set of contradictions, answering one set of problems. Um, they're almost never really testing the overall paradigm. They just kind of accept that paradigm as true, or at least true for now. The best thing they have going that's uh, allowing them to do a lot of really productive, normal science work. And so uh, they're not testing to see if the paradigm is true or false, right or wrong. They're just working within the paradigm. Um, and as I've said before, it sort of shapes all of the questions that they ask, the kinds of answers that they expect, um, what's interesting or relevant new research to do. That's all guided by the paradigm. So it's absolutely dominating the way that they think about their professional lives as career scientists and how they interact with the larger scientific community. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> this is also one of the ways that Thomas Kuhn thought that we could distinguish between science and non-science, especially science and pseudoscience, uh, that real science, something that's deserving, a field of research or a field of 
anything, a field of academia that's worthy of the label science is one that has an established paradigm that's guiding its research. Uh, some fields of science, you know, I think a good example might be uh, psychology. Uh, you go back a few decades and it was pretty clear there was not sort of a standard accepted paradigm within psychology. Uh, so it's not clear that it fully qualified as a science yet. And it's done a lot better over the last few decades. And so psychology seems to sort of still be in the process of establishing its paradigm that guides its normal science and gets psychology to qualify as a full-fledged science, at least according to the way Thomas Kuhn thought of science. Okay. Uh, as I said before, scientists are never really testing the paradigm itself. Uh, they're just doing work within the accepted paradigm. So when they get negative results or results that are unexpected or contradict what the paradigm is set up uh, as a plausible answer to some research question that's being asked and studied, or they get something that just uh, seems nonsensical within the paradigm, then uh, this is not taken as evidence that the paradigm is wrong because they're sort of accepting that the paradigm is true. It's been doing a good job. That's why it's the paradigm that's been accepted in a particular field of study is because it's really doing a, a lot of positive help for uh, making progress in normal science. Uh, so instead, as Thomas Kuhn describes it, any results that are sort of negative results or somehow contradict the paradigm or just don't make sense within the paradigm, they're blamed on what are called auxiliary assumptions. So auxiliary assumptions are things about your experiment or about your test or your research overall that you assume are going according to plan, but might not be. Here's a really simple example. Let's say that in your uh, experimental procedure, you need to weigh out a few grams of some particular powder, like a, a kind of salt or something like that. You need to weigh out exactly five grams uh, every time you conduct your experiment. Well, you assume that the balance you're using, the scale that you're using, is properly calibrated so that when the number on the scale says five grams, you have actually got five grams of the material that you're weighing out. That's an assumption that you're making. Hopefully you've checked at some point to make sure that that scale really is accurate, but you assume it is accurate as you're conducting your experiment so that if it turns out that your experiment goes wrong and gives like really contradictory results or confusing results, one of the things that you can go back and check is to see if that assumption that that scale is working properly, check to see if that assumption is correct. And that's just one teeny example you know, if you think about real scientific experiments, there's hundreds, maybe even thousands of auxiliary assumptions involved that if you get uh, bad results one way or another, you have to check as a professional scientist, you have to check all of those auxiliary assumptions before you assume then that uh, this really is a, a, a correct result. <laughs> it's, um, it, the chances are good that it's one of the auxiliary assumptions that went wrong rather than the paradigm overall is somehow, somehow faulty. And certainly before a research group is ever going to present their results to the scientific community overall and say like, oh, look, we have results that contradict the paradigm, they had better have checked all of their auxiliary assumptions before they announced something like that. Otherwise, the scientific community is going to look at their work and say, oh, geez, you didn't check any of these auxiliary assumptions before we're going to listen to you. You better check all of that stuff, then come back and tell us what you found. So very important that uh, scientists check their auxiliary assumptions. Um, <clears throat> so uh, and sometimes this is uh, takes a lot of work. In fact, a lot of the time it takes a lot of work to check all of those auxiliary assumptions. Like I said, there could be thousands of them. So uh, it takes a lot of, in some cases, creativity to come up with some other way of studying this question that seems to be giving you weird results. Uh, and so there's a lot of creativity involved with sort of tracking down all of those auxiliary assumptions. And if somehow the results that 
uh, are getting just, they keep coming out the same way, negative, 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 or contradictory to the paradigm, then a scientist will try to attack the problem from a bunch of different angles, redesign their research somehow to try to get their results back in line with the paradigm. Sometimes, however, uh, the result that's negative or somehow contradicting the paradigm or just doesn't make sense within the paradigm, it really sticks, right? No matter how the scientists approach the problem, they just can't get this weird or contradictory result to go away. Uh, when we're faced with something like that, Kuhn calls it an anomaly in the paradigm. And there could be, as I say here, big rewards. It could be like a Nobel Prize on the line for resolving one of these anomalies within a paradigm uh, and allowing normal science to continue to move forward. But sometimes like, the anomaly just persists. There's just no way within the current paradigm to resolve the anomaly. Uh, here's a, a classic example. Uh, I won't go into the details here, but the orbit of Mercury according to the old Newtonian paradigm that had been working fantastically well for centuries, uh, it just couldn't quite handle what was going on with the orbit of Mercury. Uh, Mercury's orbit, like the other, every other orbit, is uh, shaped like an ellipse, but that elliptical path is sort of rotating over many, many years. And that was not something that could make sense within the old Newtonian paradigm. And so that was an anomaly that just stuck uh, they couldn't get rid of it. They couldn't somehow uh, resolve the weird orbit of Mercury within the Newtonian paradigm. So I just kind of set it aside, right? It's like, we just can't figure out how to fix this. So let's set it aside and move forward with our normal science because this other thing just seems like it's not gonna work. But sometimes if it's a, an anomaly that's really central to the paradigm, or something that just can't be resolved over the long term, or many anomalies start to build up within a paradigm, then the scientists in that field of study might start to finally lose confidence in their paradigm. And that can lead to what uh, Thomas Kuhn calls extraordinary science, or a time of crisis, where uh, since the scientists are not satisfied with the paradigm as it is, uh, and they've lost confidence in it, then they've lost confidence in the normal science that they had been doing within this paradigm. So they're like, well, why waste our time continuing to try to do our normal research, our normal science within a paradigm that we don't trust anymore? So this is sort of when the field enters a time of crisis. They can't do their normal work, uh, at least not nearly as much as they're used to. And so they need to come together as a community and try to figure out what to do with the paradigm. Uh, they'll start to loosen the rules of the paradigm and loosen the foundational assumptions of the paradigm and start to play with some of these things that, that were sort of off limits up until this point. Uh, they might even suggest completely new paradigms to, as a replacement for the paradigm that starts to have all of these anomalies showing up. One way or another, uh, the scientific community sort of goes into this time of debate where they're trying to figure out what to do with the paradigm, replace it, change it, whatever, until finally they will settle down on a, a paradigm that they all agree on and then get back to doing normal science again. And so uh, these are the, potentially the time of scientific revolution that, that Thomas Kuhn was talking about in the title of his book here. So, uh, and here's a term that I think almost everybody's heard by now. Uh, it's kind of made its way into the popular lexicon. If a community settles, a community of scientists settles on a new paradigm, then it's a revolution or has, as he calls it, a paradigm shift. Um, almost everybody's heard of this term paradigm shift. And, you know, so it's been applied to many things other than science, but Thomas Kuhn thought of it in this context as sort of this new way of thinking about this field of study that can now guide normal science again. Uh, here's some examples. Um, some of these, you know, it's not clear that, say, like this Aristotelian theory, if we want to call it that, going back to the ancient times and all the way up through the Middle Ages and into the beginning of the European Renaissance, um, that that quite qualified as a full scientific paradigm, according to the way Thomas Kuhn thought about it. Same thing with alchemy and definitely with creationism. But nevertheless, I list these as kind of times where there was definitely a revolution in a field of study 
and the result was a shift to an established paradigm that guides normal science. So um, from Aristotle to Newton, and then from the Newtonian paradigm, classic example of a paradigm, that one definitely qualifies. Um, and then more recently, uh, there was another revolution and a shift away from the Newtonian paradigm, and interestingly, to two separate paradigms, general relativity and quantum mechanics are the two paradigms that dominate physics nowadays. Um, molecular chemistry is certainly the dominant paradigm now. Darwinian evolutionary theory is sort of the core of the paradigm that dominates biology. So hopefully this gives you a little sense of uh, what a paradigm is and uh, some of the big shifts that have happened throughout history. These are giant ones. Um, Kuhn also talks about some like minor shifts, like little mini paradigms that can also be shifted and you know, old paradigms rejected and new paradigms incorporated in different fields of scientific study. Um, but these are some giant ones. Okay, so uh, up until this point, um, you know, philosophers of science or historians of science, uh, they might sort of debate about some of the details and, you know, things that they agree with from Kuhn and things that they disagree with. But by and large, Thomas Kuhn se seems to have, in fact, captured uh, some important elements about how scientists do their work. That it seems at least roughly true that scientists tend to work within a paradigm that they kind of accept without too much question, and they just do their work within that paradigm, and that sometimes enough anomalies will build up within a paradigm for them to sort of reject the paradigm that they're currently working with and shift to a new one. Um, that sort of thing seems to happen. Whether it happens exactly the way Kuhn describes it or not, like again, there's, there's room for debate there. But by and large, what I've described so far is not super controversial. The controversial part of Thomas Kuhn's coming up next, because um, he started to think about this, this paradigm shift, this period of extraordinary science and crisis and revolution that's going on uh, in a field of study uh, when too many anomalies have built up within its paradigm. Well, he refers back to work of people like N.R. Hansen from a couple decades before uh, Kuhn wrote his book. Uh, and these people were making the case that uh, our, our understanding of the world and even our basic perceptions of our world, um, but certainly our understanding of it, our interpretation of it is highly influenced by our backgrounds, our background education for sure, especially when we're talking about science, what paradigm have you been trained in that's going to guide how you think about the world and how you think about science itself and how you think about that field of research that you're working in all of your understanding about it, like I said, your ontology, the things that you believe yourself to be studying. This is all formed by your background education, but then also potentially things like uh, what culture you come from, what religion you come from, what social groups you belong to, all of these kinds of things shape the way you think about your world. Um, it can influence the way you perceive the world. And so Thomas Kuhn uh, recognized this stuff and he started to apply it to his idea of paradigm shifts, and he started to get a little bit worried. He wasn't sort of, I'm, I'm going to describe a big problem here, and he wasn't convinced that the problem was like absolutely devastating or anything like that, but he was sort of worried that there might be a problem looming here for this paradigm shift idea. Here's what he worried about. So we've got adherence to, let's say we're in a time of crisis, right? It, uh, extraordinary science where the scientific community is debating, like, do we keep our old paradigm? Do we modify it? Do we shift to a completely new paradigm? So let's say that we've got, um, to keep it simple, two camps, right? Two camps within the scientific community. Um, one camp, one side of the scientific community is uh, committed to paradigm A. And they uh, make their case to the scientific community they say, uh, look, here's all of the reasons why we think this community should adopt paradigm A. Uh, they present all of their evidence and so on and their specific scientific arguments and they make their case. Okay, um, and then there's the people in, that are committed to paradigm B. Uh, and they say, okay, I hear what you said, people in favor of paradigm A, but uh, the things that your argument, your basic evidence, and your reasoning and your assumptions about how science works. Um, none of those things really make sense according to our paradigm. 
Uh, they make sense according to your paradigm, but from, from within our paradigm, your arguments just don't really apply. And so then the people in favor of paradigm B make their case and they say, here's all of our evidence and all of our scientific reasons in favor of our paradigm. But then of course, the people in paradigm A are gonna say, okay, I hear what you're saying, but none of your evidence or arguments really make sense. And they're certainly not convincing from the perspective of paradigm A, our paradigm. So they're stuck. Um, it starts to sound a little bit like people arguing over religion, right? So if you've got, say, like, you know, a, a committed Christian debating with a committed Buddhist, and the Christian says, oh, you should adopt our paradigm because you want to be able to get into heaven, you want to avoid hell, you know, and they give all of these sort of Christianity-based reasons why Christianity is the way to go. And the Buddhist says, well, okay, that's, I, I maybe kind of understand what you're saying, but none of those arguments make sense from within my religion, um, from within Buddhism. Like, we don't believe in heaven and hell in the way that you're thinking. And so those arguments just aren't convincing. And they give their own arguments. You know, you want to be able to, you know, follow this proper path and so on. You want to avoid attachments and those sorts of things. Um, and I'm no expert on Buddhism or Christianity, but uh, they'll make their case for their religion. And of course, the Christians are going to hear that and say, okay, but that doesn't make sense within our religion. So how do they decide, right? There's no way to show that one, there's no neutral ground at which we can evaluate which religion is the correct religion. So Kuhn thought something like that might be happening uh, in science when the scientific community is debating over like which scientific paradigm to accept. Um, he was worried, as I say here, that there's no neutral paradigm-free way to evaluate the relative merits of competing scientific paradigms. The term that he used is that the, these rival scientific paradigms might be incommensurable. There's no scientific way of deciding which is the better scientific paradigm because the scientific way of deciding such things are established by a paradigm. <laughs> so what works for paradigm A is not gonna work for paradigm B and vice versa. So how do they figure it out? Um, <clears throat> if it's the case that uh, you know, these paradigms really are incommensurable, then there's just no scientific argument that can be made to establish that one paradigm is better. So what's left? This is where it starts to get controversial, right? This, is, this kind of exploded in academia to a certain extent uh, and prompted a ton of debate. Um, so he suggested that maybe, remember, I'm, I'm trying to emphasize that Kuhn was not committed to this being the case. Um, he was just worried that maybe these revolutions are won by non-scientific factors, social factors, uh, maybe emotional factors. You know, you talk about like, who's the most famous scientists? What, you know, so for example, if you think back to the early 20th century, uh, you know, and into the 20s and 30s, there's Einstein, right? Albert Einstein, like who's gonna go against Albert Einstein? Um, if Einstein says, yes, this is the paradigm that we should accept, you know, and I'm just some lowly physics researcher and I'm not involved with these high-end debates, like I'm gonna think like, oh, well, I'm gonna go with whatever Einstein says. That's not a scientific argument. That's based on social connections, right? And, and my beliefs in the greatness of Einstein. Um, emotional reasons. Einstein himself even sometimes spoke this way in favor of his own general relativity theory. Uh, he said, described as sort of a, in others, would describe it as an elegant theory. It's like, okay, maybe it's an elegant theory, but elegance? How is that a scientific consideration, right? That's not a, a scientific reason in favor of accepting a paradigm. It's sort of a, it's an aesthetic reason for accepting a paradigm. So that seems a little odd. Um, practical reasons for accepting one paradigm over another. Um, maybe this kind of connects also with economic reasons. You know, they might have already invested millions of dollars in sort of all of their laboratory equipment and hiring all their technicians and so on. And so they've got a strong investment already in a particular paradigm. And so that could cause a lot of resistance to shifting to a new paradigm that could render a lot of their, uh, their equipment obsolete. They'd have to invest in all new stuff. Um, and that's a practical reason for not 
shifting to a new paradigm. Political reasons, maybe. Um, you know, unfortunately, sometimes politics does creep in to science. Um, we see this really dramatically, especially nowadays with climate science. Um, you see sometimes, you know, non-scientists for the most part, the accusing scientists of accepting kind of the climate science paradigm as we understand it today, accepting that for political reasons or maybe for economic reasons. It's like, oh, they just want to keep getting paid. That's why they think that this is happening to the climate, right? So a lot of those thoughts and strategies for sort of criticizing scientists, um, whether the critics know it or not, it was Thomas Kuhn that kind of prompted a lot of this line of reasoning for, and, and way of criticizing what scientists are doing. So whichever side then is most persuasive for whatever reason, um, for these non-scientific reasons, they could very easily end up winning the day and having their paradigm established as the new paradigm. So it's not for scientific reasons, it's for social reasons or just some other non-scientific reasons for picking a new paradigm. So this is a problem. <laughs> if that's the way this really works, then this is a big problem. Um, because this means that over the long term, science doesn't really make progress. Progress can only really be understood from within a certain paradigm. So if the switch from one paradigm to another, there's no scientific case that can be made for switching to that new paradigm, then there's no scientific reason for thinking that the new paradigm is somehow scientifically better or more advanced or closer to the truth than the old paradigm. It's just different. So instead of gradually over time, as we shift from one paradigm to the next, getting closer and closer to a true understanding of nature, instead, according to this view, we're just sort of jumping from paradigm to paradigm um, and no one paradigm is scientifically better, more accurate or more true than any other paradigm. So you can see how this could be you know, a potential big problem for science because science uh, you know, scientists assume that their job is to uncover the truth and to gradually over time as a community to get closer and closer to a true understanding of the way nature actually is. But here, truth is just defined from within a paradigm. So it's a kind of relativism about truth. <laughs> and so he was using his understanding of how science works to uh, land on this conclusion that maybe truth is relative to your paradigm. And it's almost like, well, whichever paradigm just appeals to you is the paradigm to accept. And then now your truth is established by the paradigm that you just prefer for maybe emotional or social reasons or political reasons, economic reasons, not scientific reasons. So big problem for science. Um, and I think you can sort of recognize how this sort of attitude is kind of spread out into the rest of our society. We have um, you know, different people holding different truths and there's not necessarily a shared understanding of what's true among everybody in society. Depends on what maybe what political paradigm or religious paradigm to accept. Okay, so I'll go ahead and stop there. Kuhn does have a follow-up here. He recognized these problems after he published his book. And uh, in the next edition of his book, he added an extra chapter to try to handle these things and sort of bring science back to something that's more recognizable to the scientists, that over the long term, it actually is making progress to the truth. But I'll save that for another presentation. Thanks.